And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. Stockman smiled at this and the investigator concluded, You simply do not possess a sound intelligence. You persist in denials to your own harm. It is quite clear that you have been sent here by your party in order to carry on demoralizing activities among the Cossacks, in order to turn them against the government. I fail to understand why you were playing this game of pretense. It cannot diminish your offense. Those are all guesses on your part. May I smoke? Thank you. And they are guesses entirely without foundation. Did you read this book to the workers who visited your rooms? The investigator put his hand on a small book and covered the title. Above his hand, the name Plikhanov was visible. We read poetry, Stockman replied, and puffed at his cigarette, gripping the bone holder tightly between his fingers. The next morning, the postal Tarantas drove out of the village with Stockman dozing on the back seat, his beard buried in his coat collar. On each side of him, a militiaman, armed with a drawn saber, was squeezed on the seat. One of them, the pockmarked man who had made the search, gripped Stockman's elbow firmly in his knotty, dirty fingers, casting timorous, sidelong glances at him. The Tarantas rattled briskly down the street. By the Melyukov's farmyard, a little woman wrapped in a shawl stood waiting for it, her back against the wattle fence. Her gray face was wet with the tears that filled her eyes. The Tarantas sped past, and the woman, pressing her hands to her breast, flung herself after it. Osip! Osip Davidovich! Oh, how could they? Stockman wanted to wave his hand to her, but the pockmarked militia man jumped up and clutched his arm, and in a hoarse, savage voice shouted, Sit down or I'll cut you down. For the first time in all his simple life, he had seen a man who dared to act against the Tsar himself. The long road from Tatarsk to the little town of Radzivilova lay somewhere behind him in a gray, intangible mist. Grigor tried occasionally to recall the road, but could only dimly remember station buildings, the wagon wheels clattering beneath the unstable floor, the scent of horses and hay, endless threads of railway line flowing under the wagons, the smoke that billowed in through the open door, and the bearded face of a gendarme on the station platform, either at Varanyezh or at Kiev, he was not sure which. At the place where they detrained were crowds of officers and clean-shaven men in gray overcoats, talking a language he could not understand. It took a long time for the horses to be unloaded, but when this had been accomplished, the assistant echelon commander led three hundred or more Cossacks to the veterinary hospital. Here followed a long procedure in connection with the examination of the horses, then allotment to troops. The first troop was formed of light brown horses, the second of bay and dun, the third of dark brown. Gregor was allotted to the fourth, which consisted of plain brown and golden horses. The fifth was composed entirely of sorrel, and the sixth of black horses. Their road led them along the macadam highway. The dawn horses, which had never seen metalled roads before, at first stepped along gingerly, setting their ears back and snorting. But after a while they grew accustomed to the strange feel of the road. The unfamiliar Polish land was crisscrossed with slices of straggling wood. The day was warm and cloudy, and the sun wandered behind a dense curtain of cloud. The estate of Radzivilova was some three miles from the station, and they reached it in half an hour. Stroking his horse's neck, Grigor stared at the neatly built two-storied house, the wooden fence, and the unfamiliar style of the farm buildings. But as they rode past the orchard, the bare trees whispered the same language as those in the distant dawn country. Life now showed its tedious, stupefying side to the Cossacks. Torn away from their field labor, they quickly tired at first, and spent most of their free time talking. Grigor's troop was quartered in the great tile-roofed wing of the house, and slept on pallet beds under the windows. Grigor's bed was by the farthest window. At night, the paper, pasted over the chinks of the window, sounded in the breeze like a distant shepherd's horn, and as he listened to it, he was seized with a well-nigh irresistible desire to get up, go to the stables, saddle his horse, and ride and ride until he reached home again. Reveille was sounded at five o'clock, and the first duty of the day was to clean and groom the horses. During the brief half-hour when the horses were feeding, there was opportunity for desultory conversation. This is a hell of a life, boys. I can't stick it. 
And the sergeant major, what a swine. He even makes us wash the horses' hoofs. They're cooking pancakes at home now. Today is Shrove Tuesday. I bet my wife is saying, I wonder what my Mikhail is doing. During exercise, the officers stood smoking at the side of the yard, occasionally intervening. As Grigor glanced at the polished, well-groomed officers in their handsome gray cloaks and closely fitting uniforms, he felt that there was an impassable wall between him and them. Their very different, well-ordered, far-from-Cossack existence flowed on peacefully, untroubled by mud, fleas, or fear of the sergeant major's fists. An incident which occurred on the third day after their arrival at Radzivilova made a painful impression on Gregor, and indeed on all the young Cossacks. They were being instructed in cavalry drill, and Prokhor Zikov's horse happened to kick the sergeant major's as it passed. The blow was not very hard, and it only slightly cut the skin on the horse's left leg, but the sergeant major struck Prokhor across the face with his whip, and riding right at him shouted, Why the hell don't you look where you're going to, you son of a swine? I'll show you. You'll spend the next three days with me. The company commander happened to witness the scene, but he turned his back, rubbing the sword knot of his saber and yawning boredly. His lips trembling, Prokhor rubbed a streak of blood from his swollen cheek. As Gregor rode past, he glanced across at the officers, but they were talking together unconcernedly, as though nothing untoward had happened. The dreary, monotonous order of existence crushed the life out of the young Cossacks. Until sundown, they were kept continuously at foot and horse exercises, and in the evening the horses had to be groomed and fed. Only at ten o'clock, after the roll call and stationing of guards, were they drawn up for prayers, and the sergeant major his eyes wandering over the ranks before him intoned a pater noster. In the morning, the same routine began again, and the days were as like one another as peas. In the whole of the estate, there were only two women, the old wife of the steward and the steward's comely young kitchen maid, Franya. Franya was often to be seen in the kitchen where the old, browless army cook was in charge. The various troops watched every movement of the young girl's skirt as she ran across the yard. Feeling the gaze of the officers and Cossacks fixed upon her, she bathed in the streams of lasciviousness that came from three hundred pairs of eyes and swung her hips provokingly as she ran backward and forward between the kitchen and the house, smiling at each troop in turn, but at the officers in particular. Although all fought for her attentions, rumor had it that only the company commander had won them. One day in early spring, Gregor was on duty all day in the great stables. He spent most of his time at one end where the officers' horses were excited by the presence of a mare. He had just walked past the stall containing the company commander's horse when he heard a sound of struggling and a muffled cry coming from the dark corner at the far end of the stable. A little astonished by the unusual noise, he hurried past the stalls. His eyes were suddenly blinded as someone slammed the stable door and he heard a voice calling in a suppressed shout, Hurry up, boys! Gregor hastened his steps and called out, Who is that? The next moment he knocked against one of his company sergeants, who was groping his way to the door. That you, Melyakov? The sergeant whispered, putting his hand on Gregor's shoulder. Stop! What's up? Gregor demanded. The sergeant burst into a guilty snigger and seized Gregor's sleeve. Tearing his arm away, Gregor ran and threw open the door. The light momentarily blinded him. He shaded his eyes with his hand and turned round, hearing an increasing noise in the dark corner of the stable. He went towards the sound and was met by Zharkov buttoning up his trousers. What the... what are you doing here? Hurry up, Zharkov whispered, breathing in Gregor's face. They've dragged the girl Franya in there, undressed her. His snigger suddenly broke off as Gregor sent him flying against the stable wall. Running to the corner... Gregor found a crowd of Cossacks of the first troop struggling with one another to get to the middle. He silently pushed his way through them and saw Franya lying motionless on the floor, her head wrapped in a horse cloth, her dress torn and pulled back above her breasts, her white legs flung out shamelessly and horribly. A Cossack had just risen from her, holding up his trousers and not looking at his comrades. With a sheepish grin, he fell back to make way for the rest. Gregor tore his way back through the crowd and ran to the door, shouting for the sergeant major. But the other Cossacks ran after him and caught him at the door, flinging him back and one putting a hand over his mouth. 
He sent one man flying and gave another a kick in the stomach, but the others flung a horse cloth around his head, tied his hands behind him, and threw him into an empty manger. Choking in the stinking horse cloth, he tried to shout and kicked lustily at the partition. He heard whispering in the corner and the door creaking as the Cossacks went in and out. He was set free some twenty minutes later. At the door, the sergeant major and two Cossacks from another troop were standing. You just keep your mouth shut, the sergeant major said to him, winking hard but not looking at him. The two Cossacks went in and lifted up the motionless bundle that was Franya, and climbing onto a manger, thrust it through a hole left in the wall by a badly fitting plank. The wall bordered on the orchard. Above each stall was a tiny, grimy window. Some of the Cossacks clambered onto the stall partitions to watch what Franya would do. Others hastened out of the stables. Grieger also was possessed by a bestial curiosity, and getting onto a partition, he drew himself up to one of the windows and looked down. Dozens of eyes were thus staring through the dirty windows at the girl lying under the wall. She lay on her back, her legs crossing and uncrossing like scissor blades, her fingers scrabbling in the snow by the wall. She lay there a long time, and at last struggled onto her hands and knees. Gregor could clearly see her arms trembling, hardly able to bear her. Swaying, she scrambled to her feet and disheveled, unfamiliar, hostile. She passed her eyes in a long, slow stare over the windows. Then she went, one hand clinging to the woodbine bushes, the other resting and groping along the wall. Gregor jumped down from the partition and rubbed his throat, feeling that he was about to choke. At the door, someone, afterwards he could not even remember who, said to him in distinct and unequivocal tones, Breathe a word, and by Christ we'll kill you. On the parade ground, the troop commander noticed that a button had been torn from Gregor's greatcoat and asked, Who have you been wrestling with? What style do you call this? Gregor glanced down at the little round hole left by the missing button. Overwhelmed by the memory, for the first time for many a day, he felt like crying. Part Two War Chapter One A sultry, sunny July haze lay over the steppe. The ripe floods of wheat smoked with yellow dust. The metal parts of the reapers were too hot to be touched with the hand. It was painful to look up at the bluish-yellow flaming sky. Where the wheat ended, a saffron sweep of clover began. The entire village of Tatarsk had moved out into the steppe. The horses choked in the heat and the pungent dust, and were restive as they dragged the reapers. The wind blowing from the river raised clouds of dust from the steppe, and the sun was enveloped in a tingling haze. Since early morning, Pyotr, who was forking the wheat off the reaper platform, had drunk half a bucketful of water. Within a minute of his drinking the warm, unpleasant liquid, his throat was dry again. His shirt was wet through. The sweat streamed from his face. There was a continual trilling ring in his ears. Her face covered with her kerchief, her shirt unbuttoned, Daria was gathering the corn into stooks. A grayish, granular sweat ran down between her urgent breasts. Natalia was leading the horses. Her cheeks were burnt the color of beetroot. Her eyes were filled with tears because of the glaring sun. Pantoljemin was walking up and down the swaths of corn, his wet shirt scalding his body. His beard felt as though it were a stream of melting black cart grease flowing over his chest. At last, Daria could stand no more. Pyotr, she called. Let's stop. Wait a bit, we'll finish this row, he answered. Let's put it off till it's cooler. I've had enough. Natalia halted the horses. Her chest was heaving as though it were she who had been pulling the reaper. Daria went across to them, her bare feet slapping carefully over the cut corn. Pyotr, we're not far from the lake here. Not far? Only two miles or so? A bath would be good. While you're getting there and back, sighed Natalia. Why the devil should we walk? We'll unharness the horses and ride. Pyotr glanced uneasily at his father, tying up a sheaf and waved his hand. All right, unharness the horses. Darya unfastened the traces and dexterously jumped onto the mare's back. Natalia smilingly led her horse to the reaper and tried to mount from the driver's seat. Pyotr went to her aid and hoisted her by her leg onto the horse. They rode off. Darya, sitting her horse Cossack fashion, trotted in front, her skirt tucked up above her bare knees, 
her kerchief pressed tightly over the back of her head. As they crossed the field track, Piotr glanced to his left and noticed a tiny cloud of dust moving swiftly along the distant high road from the village. Someone riding there, he remarked to Natalia, screwing up his eyes. And fast, too. Look at the dust, Natalia replied in surprise. Who on earth can it be? Daria, Piotr called to his wife. Rein in for a minute and let's watch that rider. The cloud of dust dropped down into a hollow and disappeared, then came up again on the other side. Now the figure of the rider could be seen through the dust. Piotr sat gazing, his dirty palm set against the edge of his straw summer hat. He frowned and took his hand away. An agitated expression passed across his face. Now the horseman could be seen quite plainly. He was riding his horse at a furious gallop, his left hand holding on his cap, a dusty red flag fluttering in his right. He rode along the track so close to them that Piotr heard his horse's panting breath. As he passed, the man shouted, Alarm! A flake of yellow soapy foam flew from his horse and fell into a hoof print. Piotr followed the rider with his eyes. The heavy snort of the horse, and, as he stared after the retreating figure, the horse's croup, wet and glittering like a steel blade, remained impressed in his memory. Still not realizing the nature of the misfortune that had come at last upon them, Piotr gazed stupidly at the foam lying in the dust, then glanced around the rolling step. From all sides, the Cossacks were running over the yellow strips of grass towards the village. Across the steppe, as far as the distant upland, little clouds of dust betokening horsemen were to be seen. Along the tracks, they were riding in a dense mass, and long trails of dust moved along the roads. What is it all about? Natalia half groaned, looking fearfully at Piotr. Her gaze, the gaze of a hare in a trap, startled him. He galloped back to the reaper, jumped off his horse before it had halted, hustled into the trousers he had flung off while working, and waving his hand to his father, tore off to add one more cloud of dust to those which had already blossomed over the sultry steppe. He found a dense gray crowd assembled on the square. Many were already wearing their army uniform and equipment. The blue military caps of the men belonging to the Ottoman's regiment rose a head higher than the rest, like swans among geese. The village tavern was closed. The military commissary had a gloomy and careworn look. The women, attired in their holiday clothes, lined the fences along the streets. One word was on everybody's lips. Mobilization. Intoxicated, excited faces. The general anxiety had been communicated to the horses, and they were kicking and plunging and snorting angrily. The square was strewn with empty bottles and the papers of cheap sweets. A low cloud of dust hung in the air. Piotr led his saddled horse by the rein. Close to the church fence, a healthy-looking, swarthy Cossack of the Ottoman's regiment was buttoning up his blue trousers, his mouth gaping with a smile, whilst around him a stocky little woman, his wife or lover, was bustling and nagging. Near to him a red-bearded sergeant major was arguing with an artillery man. Nothing will come of it, never fear, he was assuring him. We'll be mobilized for a few days and then back home again. But supposing there is a war... Ah, my friend, what power could stand on its feet against us? In a neighboring group, a handsome elderly Cossack was waxing indignant. It's nothing to do with us. Let them do their own fighting. We haven't got our corn in yet. It's a shame. Here we are standing here, and on a day like this we could harvest enough for a whole year. The cattle will get among the stooks, and we'd just begun to reap the barley. But the Ottoman said they'd called us up only in case anything happened. Another twelve months, and I'd have been out of the third line of reserves, an elderly Cossack said regretfully. Don't you worry. As soon as they start killing the men off, they'll be taking the old ones, too, someone reassured him. Three Cossacks led a fourth, completely drunk and stained with blood, into the village administration. He threw himself back, tore his shirt open, and rolling his eyes, shouted, I'll show their peasants. I'll have their blood. They'll know the Don Cossack. The circle around him laughed approvingly. That's right. Give it to them. What have they tied him up for? He went for some peasant. Well, they deserve it. We'll give them some more. I took a hand when they put them down in 1905. That was a sight worth seeing. There's going to be war. They'll be sending us again to put them down. Outside Mokhov's shop was a surging crowd. In the middle, Ivan Tamilin was drunkenly arguing with Sergei Platonovich. 
What's all this? Mokhov expostulated. My word, this is an outrage. Boy, run for the ottoman. Rubbing his sweaty hands on his trousers, Tamilin pressed against the frowning merchant and sneered. You've squeezed us and squeezed us with your interest, you swine, and now you've got the wind up. I'll smash your face in, you serpent. The village ottoman was busily pouring out the oil of soothing words for the benefit of the Cossacks surrounding him. War? No, there won't be any war. Their excellencies, the military commissaries, said the mobilization was only against emergency. You needn't get alarmed. Good. Back to the fields as soon as we're home, the chorus arose. Until late at night, the square was alive and noisy with excited crowds. The first reserve Cossacks from Tatarsk and the neighboring villages spent the second night after their departure from home in a little village. The Cossacks from the lower end of Tatarsk drew into a separate group from those of the upper end. So Pyotr Melyakov, Anikushka, Christonia, Stepan Astakhov, Ivan Tamilin, and others were all billeted in one hut. The Cossacks had lain down to sleep, spreading out their horse blankets in the kitchen and the front room, and were having a last smoke for the night. The master of the house, a tall, decrepit old man, who had served in the Turkish war, sat talking with them. So you're off to war, soldiers. Yes, Grandad, off to war. It won't be anything like the Turkish war was, I don't suppose. They've got different weapons now. It'll be just the same, just as devilish. Just as they killed the Turks off then, so we'll have to now, Tamilan barked, angry with no one knew whom. My sons, I ask you one thing. I ask you seriously, and you mark what I say, the old man said. Remember one thing. If you want to come back from the mortal struggle alive and with a whole skin, you must keep the law of humanity. Which one? Stepan Astakov asked, smiling uncertainly. He had begun to smile again from the day he heard of the war. The war called him, and the general anxiety and pain assuaged his own. This one. Don't take other men's goods. That's one. As you fear God, don't do wrong to any woman. That's the second. And then you must know certain prayers. The Cossacks sat up and all spoke at once. If only we didn't have to lose our own goods, not to speak of taking other people's. And why mustn't we touch a woman? How are we to stand that? The old man fixed his eyes sternly on them and answered, You must not touch a woman. Never. If you can't stand that, you'll lose your heads or you'll be wounded. You'll be sorry after, but then it will be too late. I'll tell you the prayers. I went right through the Turkish war, death on my shoulders like a saddlebag, but I came through alive because of these prayers. He went into the other room, rummaged beneath the icon, and brought back a crumbling, faded, brown scrap of paper. Get up and write them down, he commanded. You'll be off again before dawn tomorrow, won't you? He spread the paper out on the table and left it. Anikushka was the first to get up. On his smooth, womanish face, the shadows cast by the flickering light played nervously. All except Stepan sat and wrote down the prayers. Anikushka rolled up the paper he had used and fastened it to the string of the cross at his breast. Stepan jeered at him. That's a nice home you've made for the lice. Young man, if you don't believe, hold your tongue, the old man interrupted him sternly. Don't be a stone of offense to others, and don't laugh at faith. It's a sin. Stepan smiled, but he lapsed into silence. The prayers which the Cossacks wrote down were three, and each could choose which he wished. The prayer in time of attack read, Supreme Ruler, Holy Mother of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, Bless, Lord, thy slave of God entering battle, and my comrades who are with me. Wrap them in cloud with thy heavenly, stony hail, protect them. Holy Dmitri Saslutsky, defend me, the slave of God, and my comrades on all four sides. Permit not evil men to shoot, nor with spear to pierce, nor with pole-axe to strike, nor with butt-end of axe to smite, nor with axe to hew down, nor with sword to cut down or pierce, nor with knife to pierce or cut, neither old nor young, swarthy nor black, neither heretic nor wizard nor any magic worker. All is before me now, the slave of God, orphaned and judged. In the sea, in the ocean, on the island of Buyan, stands an iron post. On the post is an iron man resting on an iron staff, and he charms iron, steel, lead, zinc, and all weapons. Go, iron, into your mother earth away from the slave of God and past my comrades and my horse the arrow shafts into the forest, 
and the feather to its mother bird, and the glue to the fish. Defend me, the slave of God, with a golden buckler from steel and from bullet, cannon fire and ball, spear and knife. May my body be stronger than armor. Amen. Very similar were all the prayers which the Cossacks wrote down and concealed under their shirts, tying them to the strings of the little icons blessed by their mothers and to the little bundles of their native earth. But death came upon all alike, upon those who wrote down the prayers also. Their bodies rotted on the fields of Galicia and eastern Prussia, in the Carpathians and Romania, wherever the ruddy flames of war flickered and the traces of Cossack horses were imprinted in the earth. Some four days later, the red wagons of the troop trains were carrying the Cossacks in their regiments and batteries towards the Russo-Austrian frontier. War. The wagons hummed with talk and song. At the stations, the Cossacks were eyed with inquisitive, benevolent looks. The crowds felt the stripes on the Cossacks' trousers. War. At the stations, the women waved their handkerchiefs, smiled, threw cigarettes and sweets. Only once, just before the train reached Varanyezh, did an old railway worker thrust his head into the wagon where Pyotr Melyakov was crowded with twenty-nine other Cossacks and ask, You going? Yes, get in and come with us, Grandad, one of the Cossacks replied. My boy, bullocks for slaughter. The old man shook his head reproachfully. Chapter 2 During the second week of July 1914, the divisional staff transferred Grigor Melyakov's regiment to the town of Rovna in Volhynia to take part in maneuvers. A fortnight later, tired out with continual maneuvering, Grigor and the other Cossacks of the 4th Company were lying in their tents when the company commander, Lieutenant Polkovnikov, galloped furiously back from the regimental staff. Another attack, I suppose, Pryokor Zikhov suggested tentatively and waited for someone to agree. The troop sergeant thrust the needle with which he had been mending his trousers into the lining of his cap and remarked, I expect so. They won't let us rest for a moment. A minute or two later, the bugler sounded the alarm. The Cossacks jumped to their feet. They had their horses saddled well within regulation time. As Gregor was tearing up the tent pegs, the sergeant managed to mutter to him, It's war this time, my lad. You're lying, Gregor expressed his disbelief. God's truth, the sergeant major told me. The company formed up in the street, the commander at its head. In troop columns, his command flew over the ranks. The horses' hoofs clattered as they went at a trot out of the village onto the highway. From a neighboring village, the first and fifth companies could be seen riding towards the station. A day later, the regiment was detrained at a station some twenty miles from the Austrian frontier. Dawn was breaking beyond a group of birch trees. The morning promised to be fine. The engine fussed and rumbled over the tracks. The lines glittered with dew. The Cossacks of the 4th Company led their horses by the bridles out of the wagons and over the level crossing, mounted and moved off in column formation. Their voices sounded eerily in the crumbling, lilac darkness. Faces and the contours of horses emerged uncertainly out of the gloom. What company is that? came a challenge. And who are you? Are you lost? one of the Cossacks replied. I'll show you who I am. How dare you speak to an officer in that way? Sorry, Your Excellency, I didn't recognize you. Ride on, ride on. A little farther on the fourth company was held up for a while by the first, which had detrained before it. As they sat, the Cossacks sang quietly under their breath. Against the bluish-gray of the sky, the silhouettes of the horsemen ahead stood out clearly, as though drawn with India ink. The lances swung like bare sunflower stalks. Occasionally a stirrup jingled or a saddle creaked. Prokhor Zikhov was riding at Gregor's side. Prokhor stared into his face and whispered, Melyakov, you're not afraid, are you? What is there to be afraid of? We may take part in a battle today. Well, what about it? But I'm afraid... Prokhor admitted, his fingers playing nervously with the reins. I didn't sleep a wink all night. Once more the company advanced. The horses moved at a measured pace. The lances swayed and flowed rhythmically. Dropping the reins, Gregor dozed, and it seemed to him that it was not the horse that put its legs forward springily, rocking him in the saddle, but he himself who was passing along a warm, dark road and walking with unusual ease, with irresistible joy. 
Prochor chattered away at his side, but the voice mingled with the creak of the saddle and the clatter of hoofs and did not disturb his thoughtless doze. The company turned into a by-road. The silence rang in their ears. Ripe oats hung over the wayside, their heads smoking with dew. The horses tried to reach the low ears and dragged the reins out of their riders' hands. The gracious daylight crept under Gregor's eyelids. He raised his head and heard Prochor's monotonous voice like the creak of a cartwheel. He was abruptly aroused by a heavy, rumbling howl that billowed across the oat fields. Gunfire, Zikov almost shouted, and tears filled his calfish eyes. Gregor lifted his head. In front of him, the troop sergeant's gray greatcoat rose and fell in unison with the horse's back. On each side stretched fields of uncut corn. A skylark danced in the sky at the height of a telegraph pole. The entire company was aroused. The sound of the firing ran through it like an electric current. Lashed into activity, Lieutenant Polkovnikov put the company into a fast trot. Beyond a crossroad where a deserted tavern stood, they began to fall in with the carts of refugees. A squadron of smart-looking dragoons went by. Their captain, riding a sorrel thoroughbred, stared at the Cossacks ironically and spurred up his horse. They passed a great pock-marked artillery man carrying an armful of boards, probably torn from the fence of the tavern, and came upon a howitzer battery stranded in a muddy and swampy hollow. The riders were lashing at their horses whilst the gunners struggled with the carriage wheels. A little farther on, they overtook an infantry regiment. The soldiers were marching swiftly, their overcoats flung back. The sun glittered on their polished helmets and streamed from their bayonets. A corporal in the last company threw a lump of mud at Gregor. Here, catch! Chuck it at the Austrians! Don't play about, grasshopper, Gregor replied, and cut the lump of mud in its flight with his whip. From now on, they were continually passing foot regiments, crawling like caterpillars, batteries, baggage wagons, Red Cross wagons. The deathly breath of eminent battle was in the air. A little later, as it was entering a village, the fourth company was overtaken by the commander of the regiment, Colonel Kalyedin, accompanied by his second in command. As they passed, Grigor heard the latter say agitatedly to Kalyedin, This village isn't marked on the ordnance map, Vasily Maximovich. We may find ourselves in an awkward situation. Gregor did not catch the colonel's reply. The regiment was continually changing its pace, and the horses began to sweat. In the distance appeared the huts of a little village lying under a steep slope. On the other side of the village was a wood, its green treetops piercing the azure dome of the sky. From beyond the wood came the sound of gunfire, mingled with the frequent rattle of rifle shots. The horses pricked up their ears. The smoke of bursting shrapnel hovered in the sky a long way off. The rifle fire came from the right of the company. Gregor listened tensely to every sound. His nerves tautened into little bundles of sensation. Prokhor Zikov fidgeted in his saddle, talking incessantly. Gregor, those shots sound just like boys rattling sticks along railings, don't they? He remarked. Shut up, magpie. The company entered the village. Russian soldiers were overrunning the yards. The inhabitants of the huts were packing their belongings to flee, their faces impressed with alarm and confusion. As Grigor passed, he noticed that soldiers were firing the roof of a shed, but its owner, a tall, gray-haired, white Russian, crushed by his sudden misfortune, went past them without paying the slightest attention. Grigor saw the man's family loading a cart with red-covered pillows and ramshackle furniture, and the man himself was carefully carrying a broken wheel rim, which was of no value to anybody, and had probably lain in the yard for years. Gregor was amazed at the stupidity of the women, who were piling the carts with painted pots and icons, and were leaving necessary and valuable articles behind in the huts. Down the street, the feathers from a feather bed blew like a miniature snowstorm. The company crossed the Austrian frontier at noon. The horses jumped across the overthrown frontier post. From the right came the sound of rifle fire. In the distance, the brick walls of a farm were visible. The sun's rays fell perpendicularly. A bitter-tasting cloud of dust settled on everything. The regimental commander issued orders for advance patrols to be detached and sent ahead. From the fourth company went the fourth troop under the troop officer Semyonov. The regiment, dissected into its companies, was left behind in a gray haze. 
a troop of some twenty Cossacks rode past the farm along the rutted road. The officer led the reconnaissance patrol a couple of miles, then halted to study his map. The Cossacks gathered in a group to smoke. Grigor dismounted to ease his saddle girth, but the sergeant shouted, What are you up to? Get back on your horse. The officer lit a cigarette and diligently swept the country ahead with his binoculars. To the right rose the serrated outline of a wood. Just over a mile away was a little village. Beyond it, a deep-running rivulet and the glassy surface of water. The officer stared intently through his binoculars, studying the deathly stillness of the village streets. But it was as deserted as a cemetery. Only the blue ribbon of water beckoned challengingly. That must be Karolyevka, the officer indicated the village with his eyes. The sergeant took his horse nearer the officer. He made no reply, but the expression of his face said eloquently, You know better than I. I'm concerned only with minor questions. We'll ride to it, the officer said irresolutely, putting away his binoculars and frowning as though he had toothache. Mightn't we run into them, Your Excellency? We'll go cautiously. They rode fearfully down into the deserted street. Every window suggested an ambush. Every open cellar door evoked a feeling of savage isolation and sent an unpleasant shudder down the back. All eyes were drawn as though by magnets to the fences and ditches. They rode in like a band of robbers or as wolves approach human habitations in the blue winter night. But the streets were empty. The silence howled stupefyingly. From the open window of one house came the naive striking of a clock. The sounds cut like pistol shots, and Gregor saw the officer tremble and his hand spasmodically grip his revolver. There was not a soul in the village. The patrol forded the river. The water reached the horses' bellies. They entered willingly and drank it as they went, while their riders pulled at the reins and urged them on. Gregor stared thirstily down at the turbid water, close yet inaccessible. It drew him almost irresistibly towards itself. If it had been possible, he would have jumped out of his saddle and lain without undressing under the drowsy murmur of the stream, so that its coolness could freshen his back and his chest. From the rise beyond the village, they saw a town in the distance. Square rows of houses, brick buildings, gardens, and church spires. The officer rode to the top of the rise and put his binoculars to his eyes. There they are, he shouted, the fingers of his left hand playing nervously. The sergeant rode to the sun-baked crest and gazed. He was followed by the other Cossacks in single file. Along the streets they saw people swarming. Wagons dammed up the side streets. Horsemen were galloping furiously. With eyes screwed up, gazing from under his palm, Gregor was able even to distinguish the gray, unfamiliar color of the uniforms. Before the town stretched the freshly dug brown lines of trenches, with men swarming about them. The sergeant drove the Cossacks hurriedly back down the rise. The officer made some pencil notes in his field notebook and then beckoned to Gregor. Mialyakov, sir. Gregor dismounted and went to the officer, his legs feeling like stone after the long ride. The officer handed him a folded paper. You've got the best horse. Deliver this to the regimental commander. At the gallop, he ordered. Gregor hid the paper in his breast pocket and went back to his horse, slipping the chin strap under his chin as he went. The officer watched him until he had mounted, then glanced at his wristwatch. The regiment had nearly reached the village of Karolyevka when Grigor rode up with the report. After reading it, the colonel gave an order to his adjutant, who galloped off to the first company. The fourth company rode through Karolyevka, and as quickly as though on the parade ground, extended over the country beyond, straightening out its horseshoe formation. The horses tossed their heads to shake off the horseflies, and there was a continual jingle of snaffles. In the midday silence, the noise of the first company passing through the village sounded heavily. And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. In the midday silence, the noise of the first company passing through the village sounded heavily. Lieutenant Polkovnikov rode on his prancing horse to the front of the ranks. Gathering the reins tightly in one hand, 
he dropped the other to his sword knot. With bated breath, Gregor awaited the word of command. The officer drew his saber from its sheath. The blade gleamed like blue light. Company! The saber was swung to the right, then to the left, and finally brought down in front of him, hanging in the air above the horse's ears. In file formation, forward! Gregor mentally executed the command. Lances at the ready, into the attack, gallop! The officer snapped out the orders and gave his horse the rein. The earth groaned heavily, crushed beneath a thousand hoofs. Gregor, who was in the front rank, had hardly brought his lance to the ready when his horse, carried away by a lashing flood of other horses, broke into a gallop and went off at full speed. Ahead of him, the commanding officer rippled against the gray background of the field. A black wedge of plowed land sped irresistibly towards him. The first company raised a shrieking, quivering shout. The fourth company took it up. Through the roaring whistle in his ears, Gregor caught the sound of distant firing. The first shell flew high above them, furrowing the glassy vault of heaven. Gregor pressed the hot shaft of his lance against his side until it hurt him, and his palm sweated. The whistle of flying shells made him duck his head down to the wet neck of his horse, and the pungent scent of the animal's sweat penetrated his nostrils. As though through the misty glass of binoculars, he saw the brown ridges of trenches and men in gray running back to the town. A machine gun incessantly spread a fan of whistling bullets at the Cossacks. In front of them and under their horses' feet, they tore up woolly spurts of dust. That which before the attack had sent the blood coursing faster through his veins now turned to stone within him. He felt nothing except the ringing in his ears and a pain in the toes of his left foot. His thought, emasculated by fear, congealed in a heavy mass in his head. The ensign was the first to drop from his horse. Prochor rode over him. Gregor glanced back, and a fragment of what he saw was impressed on his memory, as though cut with a diamond on glass. As Prochor's horse leapt across the fallen officer, it bared its teeth and stumbled. Prochor flew out of the saddle as though catapulted, and falling headlong, was crushed under the hoofs of the horse behind him. Gregor heard no cry, but from Prochor's face with its distorted mouth and calf's eyes staring out of their sockets. He realized that he must be screaming inhumanly. Others fell, both horses and Cossacks. Through the film of tears caused by the wind in his eyes, Gregor stared ahead at the gray, seething mass of Austrians fleeing from the trenches. The company, which had torn away from the village in an orderly stream, scattered and broke into fragments. Those in front reached the trenches, Gregor foremost among them. A tall, white-eyebrowed Austrian, his forage cap drawn over his eyes, fired almost point-blank at Gregor. The heat of the bullet scorched his cheek. He struck with his lance, at the same time pulling on the reins with all his strength. The blow was so powerful that it pierced right through the Austrian and ran for half a shaft length out his back. Gregor was not quick enough to withdraw the lance. He felt a quivering and convulsion in his hand, and saw the Austrian, bent right back so that only the point of his chin was visible, clutching and scratching at the shaft with clawing fingers. Opening his hand, he dropped the shaft and felt with numbed fingers for his saber hilt. The Austrians fled into the streets of the town. Over the gray clots of their uniforms, the Cossack horses towered. Gregor struck at his horse with the flat of his saber, shaking its neck. It carried him away down the street. Along by the iron railings of a garden, an Austrian ran, swaying without rifle, his cap clutched in his hand. Gregor saw the back of his head and the damp collar of his tunic around his neck. He overtook him, and afire with frenzy, whirled his saber around his head. The Austrian was running close to the railings on the left-hand side, and it was awkward for Gregor to hew him down. But leaning over his saddle, holding his saber aslant, he struck at the man's temple. Without a cry, the Austrian pressed his hand to the wound and spun round with his back to the railings. Without reining in his horse, Gregor jumped across him, turned round, and rode back at a trot. The square, fear-contorted face of the Austrian was already turning the blue of cast iron. His arms were stretched down the seams of his trousers. His ashen lips were quivering. The saber had slipped from his temple, and the flesh was hanging over his cheek like a crimson rag. 
The blood streamed onto his uniform. Grieger's eyes met the mortally terror-stricken eyes of the Austrian. The man slowly bent at the knees. A gurgling groan came from his throat. Screwing up his eyes, Gregor swept his saber down. The blow split the cranium in two. The man flung out his arms and fell. His head knocked heavily against the stone of the road. At the sound, Gregor's horse took alarm and, snorting, carried him into the middle of the street. Infrequent shots sounded in the streets. Past Gregor, a foaming horse carried a dead Cossack. One foot had come out of the stirrup, and the horse was dragging the bruised and battered body over the stones. Gregor saw only the red band on the trousers and the torn green shirt drawn in a bundle over the head. Gregor's head felt as heavy as lead. He slipped from his horse and shook his head vigorously. Some Cossacks of the third company trotted past him, carrying a wounded man in their overcoats and driving a crowd of Austrian prisoners before them. The men ran in a dense gray herd, their iron-shod boots clattering joylessly on the stones. In Gregor's eyes, their faces blended into a gelid patch of clay hue. He dropped his horse's reins and went across to the Austrian soldier he had cut down. The man lay where he had fallen by the wrought iron work of the railings, his dirty brown palm stretched out as though begging. Gregor glanced at his face. It seemed small, all but childlike despite the hanging mustaches and the tortured expression of the harsh, distorted mouth. "'Hey, you!' a strange Cossack officer shouted as he rode down the middle of the street. Gregor looked up and stumbled across to his horse. His steps were burdensomely heavy and tottering, as though he were carrying an unbearable weight on his back. Loathing and perplexity crushed his spirit. He took the serrated stirrup into his hand, but for a long time he could not hoist his heavy foot into it. Chapter 3 It was usual for the Cossacks of the upper districts of the Don, including Vyshenska, to be drafted into the 11th and 12th Cossack regiments and the Ottomans' lifeguards. But for some reason, part of the enrollment of 1914 was assigned to the 3rd Don Cossack Regiment, which was composed mainly of Cossacks from the ust Medvedevsk district. Among those so drafted was Mitka Korshinov. The 3rd Don Cossack Regiment was stationed at Vilno, together with certain sections of the 3rd Cavalry Division. One day in June, the various companies rode out from the city to take up country quarters. The day was dull but warm. The flowing clouds coursed in droves across the sky and concealed the sun. The regimental band blared at the head of the column, and the officers in their light summer caps and drill uniforms rode in a bunch at the back, a cloud of cigarette smoke rising above them. On each side of the road, the peasants and their womenfolk were cutting the hay, stopping to gaze at the columns of Cossacks as they passed. The horses sweated with the heat, a yellowish foam appeared between their legs, and the light breeze blowing from the southeast did not cool, but rather intensified the steaming swelter. Arrived at its destination, the regiment was broken up by companies among the estates in the district. During the day, the Cossacks cut the clover and meadow grass for the landowners. At night, they grazed their hobbled horses in the fields assigned to them, and played cards or told stories by the smoke of the campfires. The sixth company was billeted on the large estate of a Polish landowner. The officers lived in the house, played cards, got drunk, and paid attentions to the steward's daughter. The Cossacks pitched their tents a couple of miles away from the house. Each morning, the steward drove out in a drozhki to their camp. The corpulent, estimable gentleman would get out of the drozhki and invariably welcome the Cossacks with a wave of his white, glossy-peaked cap. Come and cut hay with us, sir. It'll shake your fat down a bit, the Cossacks called to him. The steward smiled phlegmatically, wiped his bald head with his handkerchief, and went with the sergeant major to point out the next section of hay to be cut. In the hot dusk of the June evening, the Cossacks sang around the campfires. A Cossack went to a distant land, riding his horse o'er the plain, his native village he left for I. A silvery tenor voice pined and dropped, expressing a heavy, velvety sorrow. He'll ne'er come back again. Now the tenor rose a tone higher, in vain did his youthful Cossack bride to the northwest gaze each morn and eve, 
waiting in hope that her Cossack deer would return from the land he ne'er will leave. Several voices struggled with the song, and it grew brisk and heavy, like home-brewed beer. But beyond the hills where the snow lies deep, the ice fields crack and the tempests blow, where angrily bow the pines and firs, the Cossack's bones lie beneath the snow. Whilst they told one another simple stories of Cossack life, the tenor would sing in an undertone, like a skylark soaring above the thawed earth of April. As the Cossack lay dying, he pleadingly asked that above him a mound should be piled for his tomb, and a hazel tree from his native land should be planted in brilliant flower to bloom. At another campfire, the company's storyteller was spinning stories. The Cossacks listened with unflagging attention. Only occasionally, when the hero of the story cleverly extricated himself from an awkward intrigue plotted against him by the Muscovites and the unclean powers, did someone's hand gleam white in the firelight as it was slapped against the leg of his boot, or a voice would utter a rapturous exclamation. Then the flowing, unbroken tones of the storyteller would continue. A week or so after the regiment's arrival at its country quarters, the company commander sent for the smith and the sergeant major. "'What condition are the horses in?' he asked. "'All in good order, Your Excellency. "'In very good order, indeed,' the sergeant major replied. "'The captain twisted his black moustaches and said, "'The regimental commander has issued instructions "'for all stirrups and bits to be tinned. "'There is to be an imperial review of the regiment. "'Let everything be polished until it gleams, "'the saddles and the rest of the equipment. "'When can you be ready?' "'The sergeant major looked at the smith. "'The smith looked at the sergeant major. "'Then both of them looked at the captain.' The sergeant major suggested, How about Sunday, Your Excellency? and respectfully touched his moustache with his finger. The preparations for the review were put in hand the same day. The Cossacks groomed their horses, cleaned the bridles, rubbed the snaffles, and the other metal parts of the horse's equipment with bath brick. By the end of the week, the regiment was shining like a new three-penny piece. Everything glittered with polish, from the horse's hoofs to the Cossacks' faces, on the Saturday, the regimental commander inspected the regiment and thanked the officers and Cossacks for their zealous preparation and splendid appearance. The azure thread of the July days reeled past. The Cossack horses were in perfect condition. Only the Cossacks themselves were uneasy and consumed with questionings. Not a whisper was to be heard of the Imperial Review. The weeks passed in unending talk, continual preparation. Then, like a bolt from the blue, came an order for the regiment to return to Vilno. They were back in the city by the evening. A second order was at once issued to the companies. The Cossacks' boxes were to be collected and stored in the barracks, and preparations made for a possible further removal. Your Excellency, what is it all about? The Cossacks implored the truth from their troop officers. The officers shrugged their shoulders. They themselves would have been very glad to know. But on the 1st of August, the regimental commander's orderly managed to whisper to a friend, It's war, my boy. You're lying. God's truth, but not a word to anyone. Next morning, the regiment was drawn up in company order outside the barracks, awaiting the commander. He came round a corner of the barrack buildings, and riding his horse to the front of the regiment, turned the animals sideways. The adjutant drew out his handkerchief to wipe his nose, but had no time to accomplish the maneuver. Into the soundless, jarring silence, the colonel threw his voice. Cossacks! Now it's coming, everyone thought. An impatient agitation kept them all on tenterhooks. Mitka Korshinov's horse was stepping from hoof to hoof, and he irritatedly brought his heel against its flank. Germany has declared war on us. Along the ranks ran a whisper as though a puff of wind had run across a field of ripe, heavy-eared oats. A horse's neigh cut the Cossacks' ears. Round eyes and gaping mouths turned in the direction of the first company where the animal had dared to neigh. The colonel said much more. He chose his words carefully, seeking to arouse a feeling of national pride. But before the mental eyes of the thousand Cossacks, it was not the silk of foreign banners that fell rustling at their feet, but their own everyday life, hard yet native, that fluttered and called... Their wives, children, lovers, ungathered grain, orphaned villages. In two hours we entrain, was the only thought that penetrated all minds. The regiment rode singing to the station. 
the Cossacks' voices drowned the band, and it lapsed into disordered silence. The officers' wives rode in drozhkis. A colorful crowd foamed along the pavement. The horses' hoofs raised a cloud of dust. Laughing at his own and others' sorrow, twitching his left shoulder so that his blue strap tossed hectically, the leading singer sang a bawdy Cossack song. Deliberately running the words into one another, to the accompaniment of newly shooed hoofs, the company carried its song along to the red wagons at the station. One of the Cossacks winked cynically at the crowd of women seeing them off. On the track, the engine bellowed warningly as it got up steam. Echelons, echelons, echelons innumerable. Along the country's arteries, over the railway lines to the western frontier, distracted Russia was driving its gray-coated blood. At a little town on the line, the regiment was broken up into its respective companies. On the instructions of the divisional staff, the 6th Company was assigned to the disposition of the 3rd Army Infantry Corps and went by forced marches to Pelikalia. On August 9th, the company commander sent for the sergeant major and a Cossack named Mrichin from the 1st Troop. Mrichin returned to the troop late in the afternoon, just as Mikha Korshinov was bringing the horses back after watering. Mrichin, a massive, swarthy Cossack, went into the hut. At the table, Shchigolkov was mending a broken rein by the light of a guttering oil lamp. Kruchkov was standing by the stove with his hands behind him, talking to Ivankov. Tomorrow, boys, we go out at daybreak to an outpost at Lyubov, Mrichin announced. Who's going? Mitka inquired, entering at that moment and setting the pitcher down at the door. Shchigolkov, Kruchkov, Rvatchev, Popov, and Ivankov. And what about me? Mitka asked. You stay here, Mitri. Well, then the devil take the lot of you. The party set out at dawn. After riding steadily for some time, from a rise they saw the large village of Lyubov lying stretched along a river valley. Mrichin chose the last farm in the village for their observation post, as it was nearest to the frontier. The master of the farm, a clean-shaven, bandy-legged pole in a white sailcloth hat, showed the Cossacks a shed in which they could stable their horses. Behind the shed was a green field of clover. Slopes rolled away to a neighboring wood, and a white stretch of grain was intersected by a road, grassland lying beyond. They took turns to watch with binoculars from the ditch behind the shed. The others lay in the cool shed, which smelt of long-stored grain, the dust of chaff, of mice, and the sweetish, moldering scent of earth. In the evening, Ivankov relieved Shchigolkov, who had been on duty all the afternoon, and adjusting the binoculars, stared in the direction of the northwest, towards the wood. He could see the snowy stretch of grain waving in the wind, and a ruddy flood of sunlight bathing the green headlands of fir wood. Beyond the village, he saw the white, glowing forms of the lads bathing in the stream. A woman's contralto voice called, Stasia, Stasia, come here! Chigolkov lit a cigarette and remarked as he went back to the shed, Look how the sunset is burning. It's blowing up for wind. That night the horses stood unsaddled. In the village all lights were extinguished and all sound died away. The following day passed in idleness. In the afternoon Popov was sent back to the company with a report. Evening, night, over the village rose the yellow brim of the young moon. From time to time a ripe apple dropped with a soft thud from the tree in the garden. About midnight, while Ivankov was on guard, he heard the sound of horses along the village street. He crawled out of the ditch to look, but the moon was swathed in cloud, and he could see nothing through the impenetrable darkness. He went and awoke Kruchkov, who was sleeping at the door. Kozma, horsemen coming, get up! Where from? They're riding into the village. They went out. The clatter of hoofs came clearly from the street some hundred yards away. We'll go into the garden. We can hear better there, Kruchkov suggested. They ran past the hut into the tiny front garden and lay down by the fence. The jingle of stirrups and creak of saddles came nearer. Now they could see the dim outline of the horsemen riding four abreast. Who goes there? Kruchkov called. And what do you want? A voice answered in Russian from the leading rank. Who goes there? I shall fire! Kruchkov rattled the bolt of his rifle. One of the riders reined in his horse and turned it towards the fence. 
We're the Frontier Guard, he said. Are you an outpost? Yes. From which regiment? The Third Cossack. Who are you talking to there, Trishin? A voice called out of the darkness. The man by the fence replied, There's a Cossack outpost stationed here, Your Excellency. A second horseman rode up to the fence. Good luck, Cossacks. Have you been here long? he asked, striking a match and lighting a cigarette. By the momentary gleam, Kruchkov saw an officer of the frontier guard. Since yesterday, he replied. Our guard is being withdrawn, the officer said. You must bear well in mind that you are now the farthest outpost. The enemy may advance tomorrow. He turned and gave the order for his men to ride on. At that moment, the wind pitilessly tore the bandage of cloud away from the moon and over the village, the gardens, the steep roof of the hut, and the detachment of frontier guards riding up the hill fell a flood of deathly yellow light. Next morning, Rvachev rode back to the company with a report. During the night, the horses had stood saddled. The Cossacks were alarmed by the thought that they were now left to confront the enemy. They had not experienced the feeling of isolation and loneliness so long as they knew the frontier guard was ahead of them, but the news that the frontier was open had a marked effect upon them. Mlichin had a talk with the Polish farmer, and for a small sum the man agreed to let them cut clover for their horses. The Pole's meadow lay not far from the shed. Mlichin sent Ivankov and Szczegolkov to mow. Szczegolkov mowed whilst Ivankov raked the dank, heavy grass together and tied it into bundles. As they were thus occupied, Mlichin, who was gazing through the binoculars along the road leading to the frontier, noticed a boy running across the fields from the southwest. The lad ran down the hill like a brown hare. When still some distance off, he shouted and waved the long sleeve of his coat. He ran up to Mlichin, gasping for breath and rolling his eyes, and panted, Cossack! Cossack! The Germans! The Germans are coming! He pointed with his hand. Holding the binoculars to his eyes, Mlichin saw a distant group of horsemen. Without removing the binoculars, he shouted, Kruchkov, run and call the boys. A German patrol is coming. Kruchkov ran to the meadow. Now Marikin could clearly see the group of horsemen flowing along beyond the grayish streak of grassland. He could even distinguish the bay color of their horses and the dark blue tint of their uniforms. There were over twenty of them, and they were riding in a compact mass, coming from the southwest, whereas he had been expecting them from the northwest. They crossed the road and went along the ridge above the valley in which the village lay. Meantime, Kruchkov ran across the field to where Ivankov and Shchigolkov were mowing. Drop it, he shouted as he came up. Now what's the matter, Shchigolkov asked, thrusting the scythe by the point into the ground. The Germans! Ivankov threw down the bundle of grass. The pole, bent almost to the ground, ran off to the hut, followed by the Cossacks. The little party leapt into their saddles and galloped up the rise out of the village. When they reached the crest of the hill, the Germans were already between them and the town of Pelicalia. They were riding at a trot, led by an officer on a duck-tailed roan. After them! We'll get them at our second outpost, Mrichin ordered. They put their horses into a swift trot. The blue uniforms of the German dragoons were clearly visible. They had caught sight of the Cossacks following them, and were cantering in the direction of the second Russian outpost, which was stationed at a farm some two miles back from the village of Lyubov. The distance between the two parties perceptibly diminished. We'll fire at them, Mrikin shouted, jumping from his saddle. Standing with the reins over their arms, the Cossacks fired. Ivankov's horse reared at the shot and sent him headlong. As he fell, he saw one of the Germans first lean to one side, then throwing out his arms, suddenly tumble from his saddle. The others did not stop, or even unsling their carbines from their shoulders, but rode on at a gallop in open formation. Mrichin was the first to remount his horse. The Cossacks plied their whips. The Germans swung to the left, and the Cossacks following them passed close to the fallen dragoon. Beyond stretched an undulating country intersected with shallow ravines. As the Germans rode up the farther side of each ravine, the Cossacks sent shots after them. A little farther on, another German went down. Our Cossacks should be coming from that farm in a minute. That's the second outpost, Morikin muttered, thrusting a cartridge into the magazine of his rifle with his tobacco-stained finger. 
As the Cossacks rode past the farm, they glanced towards it, but it was deserted. Afterwards, they learnt that the outpost had withdrawn the previous night, having discovered that the telegraph wires some half a mile away had been cut. Mrichen sent another shot after the Germans, firing from the saddle, and one, lagging slightly behind, shook his head and spurred up his horse. "'We'll drive them along to the third outpost,' Mrichen shouted, turning round to the others behind him. Only then did Ivankov notice that Mrichen's nose was peeling, and a piece of skin was hanging from his nostril. "'Why don't they turn and defend themselves?' he asked anxiously, adjusting his rifle on his back. The Germans dropped into a ravine and disappeared. On the farther side was ploughed land, on this side scrub and an occasional bush. Mrichen reined in his horse, removed his cap, and wiped the sweat away with the back of his hand. The Germans did not appear on the other side of the ravine. Mrichen looked at the others, spat, and said, Ivankov, you ride down and see where they've got to. Ivankov thirstily licked his lips and rode off. Oh, for a smoke, Kruchkov muttered, driving the gadflies off with his whip. Ivankov rode steadily down into the ravine, rising in his stirrups and gazing across the bottom. Suddenly he saw the glittering points of lances. Then the Germans appeared, their horses turned round and galloping back up the slope to the attack. During the moment in which Ivankov was wheeling his horse round, the clean-shaven, moody face of the officer and his statuesque seat in the saddle were impressed on his memory. His back felt the pinching chill of death almost painfully. He silently galloped back towards the others. Mrichin did not have time to fold up his tobacco pouch. Seeing the Germans behind Ivankov, Kruchkov was the first to ride down to meet them. The dragoons on the right flank were sweeping round to cut Ivankov off, and were overtaking him with savage swiftness. Ivankov was lashing at his horse, wry shudders passing over his face, and his eyes staring out of his head. Bent to the saddle-bow, Mrichin took the lead. Only to get back to his comrades, that one idea possessed Ivankov, and he had no thought of defense. He gathered his great body into a ball, his head touching his horse's mane. A big, ruddy-faced German overtook him and thrust his lance at his back. The point pierced Ivankov's leather belt and passed sideways for a good inch into his body. "'Brothers, turn back!' he shouted almost deliriously, drawing his saber. He parried a second thrust aimed at his side and cut down a German riding at him from the left, but he was surrounded. A German horse struck the side of his own mount, almost knocking it off its feet, and Ivankov saw the terrible face of an enemy— at point-blank range. Mrichin was the first to reach the group. He was driven off. He swung his saber and turned like an electric fan in his saddle, his teeth bared, his face changed and deathly. Ivankov was lashed across the neck with the point of a sword. A dragoon towered above him on the left, and the terrifying gleam of steel glittered in his eyes. He countered with his saber. Steel clashed against steel. From behind, a lance caught in his shoulder strap and thrust insistently, tearing the strap away. Beyond his horse's head appeared the perspiring, fevered face of an elderly German, who tried to reach Ivankov's breast with his sword. But he failed, and dropping it, he tore his carbine from its saddle holster, not turning his blinking eyes from Ivankov's face for a moment. He did not succeed in freeing his carbine, for Kruchkov reached at him across his horse with a lance he had torn from the grip of another dragoon. The German, tearing the lance away from his breast, threw himself back, groaning in fear and astonishment. Meine Mutter! Eight dragoons surrounded Kruchkov, trying to capture him alive. But causing his horse to rear, he fought until they had to attempt to strike him down. He wielded his captured lance as though on the parade ground. Beaten back, the Germans now came at him with drawn swords. They bunched together over a small patch of dismal, clayey, ploughed land, seething and rocking in the struggle as though shaken by the wind. Beside themselves with terror, the Cossacks and Germans thrust and cut at whatever came their way, backs, arms, horses, and weapons. The horses jostled and knocked against one another in a frenzy of mortal fear, Regaining some measure of self-command, Ivankov tried several times to strike at the head of a long-faced, flaxen-haired German who had fastened on him, 
but his saber fell on the man's helmet and slipped off. Mrichin broke through the ring and galloped free, streaming with blood. The German officer chased after him. Tearing his rifle from his shoulder, Mrichin fired and killed him almost at point-blank range. This proved to be the turning point in the struggle. Having lost their commander, the Germans, all of them wounded with clumsy blows, dispersed and retreated. The Cossacks did not pursue them. They did not fire after them. They rode straight back to their company at Pelikalia, whilst the Germans picked up a wounded comrade and fled towards the frontier. After riding perhaps half a mile, Ivankov swayed in his saddle. I'm... I shall drop... He halted his horse. But Mrikin pulled at his reins, crying, Come on! Kruchkov wiped the blood from his face and felt his breast. Crimson spots were showing damply on his shirt. Beyond the farm where the second outpost had been stationed, the party disagreed as to the way. To the right, Mrikin said, pointing towards the green, swampy ground of an alder wood. No, to the left, Kruchkov insisted. They separated. Mrikin and Ivankov arrived at the regimental headquarters after Kruchkov and Chigolkov. They found the Cossacks of their company awaiting them. Ivankov dropped the reins, jumped from the saddle, and swayed and fell. They had difficulty in freeing the saber-hilt from his stony grasp. Within an hour, almost the entire company rode out to where the German officer lay. The Cossacks removed his boots, clothing, and weapons and crowded around to look at the young, frowning, yellow face of the dead man. One of them managed to capture the officer's watch, and sold it on the spot to his troop sergeant. In a pocketbook they found a few coins, a letter, a lock of flaxen hair, and a photograph of a girl with a proud, smiling mouth. Afterwards this incident was transformed into an heroic exploit, Kruchkov, a favorite of the company commander, told his story and received the cross of St. George. His comrades remained in shadow. The hero was sent to the divisional staff headquarters where he lived in Clover until the end of the war, receiving three more crosses because influential women and officers came from Petersburg and Moscow to look at him. The ladies awed and owed. The ladies regaled the Don Cossack with expensive cigarettes and chocolates. At first he cursed them by all the devils, but afterwards, under the benevolent influence of the staff toadies in officers' uniforms, he made a remunerator of business out of it. He told the story of his exploit, laying the colors on thickly and lying without a twinge of conscience, while the ladies went into raptures and stared admiringly at the pockmarked brigand face of the Cossack hero. The Tsar visited headquarters and Kruchkov was taken to be shown to him. The sleepy emperor looked Kruchkov over as if he were a horse, blinked his heavy eyelids, and slapped the Cossack on the back. Good Cossack lad, he remarked, and turning to his suite, he asked for some seltzer water. Kruchkov's shaggy head was continually pictured in the newspapers and journals. There were Kruchkov brands of cigarettes. The merchants of Nizhny Novgorod presented him with a gold-mounted firearm. And what had really happened? Men had clashed on the field of death, and embraced by mortal terror, had fought, struck, inflicted blind blows on one another, wounded one another's horses. Then they had turned and fled, frightened by a shot which had killed one of their number. They had ridden away, mortally mutilated, and it was called an heroic exploit. Chapter 4 after his first battle, Grigor Melyakov was tormented by a dreary inward pain. He grew noticeably thin, lost weight, and frequently, whether attacking or resting, sleeping or waking, he saw the features and form of the Austrian whom he had killed by the railings. In his sleep he lived again and again through that first battle, and even felt the shuddering convulsion of his right hand clutching the lance. He would awake and drive the dream off violently, shading his painfully screwed-up eyes with his hand. The cavalry trampled down the ripened corn and left their hoof-prints on the fields as though hail had rattled over all Galicia. The heavy soldiers' boots tramped the roads, scratched the macadam, churned up the August mud. The gloomy face of the earth was pockmarked with shells, Fragments of iron and steel tore into it, yearning for human blood. 
At night, ruddy flickerings lit up the horizon. Trees, villages, towns were flaming like summer lightning. In August, when fruits ripen and corn is ready for harvest, the wind-swept sky was unsmilingly gray. The rare, fine days were oppressive and sultrily steaming. August declined to its close. The leaves turned an oily yellow in the orchards, and a mournful purple flooded the stalks. From a distance it seemed as though the trees were rent with wounds and streaming with blood. Grigor studied with interest the changes that occurred in his comrades. Prokhor Zikov returned from hospital with the marks of a horseshoe on his cheek, and pain and bewilderment lurking in the corner of his lips. His calfish eyes blinked more than ever. Yegor Zharkov lost no opportunity of cursing and swearing, was more bawdy than ever, and imprecated everything under the sun. Yemelian Groshev, a serious and efficient Cossack from Grigor's own village, seemed to char. His face turned dark, and he laughed awkwardly and morosely. Changes were to be observed in every face. Each was inwardly nursing and rearing the iron seeds implanted by the war, and the young Cossacks were wilting and drooping like the stalks of mown grass. The regiment was withdrawn from the line for a three-day rest, and its complement was made up by reinforcements from the dawn. The Cossacks of Grigor's company were about to go for a bathe in a neighboring lake when a considerable force of cavalry rode into the village from the station some two miles away. By the time the men had reached the dam of the lake, the force was riding down the hill. Prokhor Zikov was pulling off his shirt when, looking up, he stared and exclaimed, They're Cossacks! Dawn Cossacks! Grigor gazed after the column, crawling like a snake into the road leading to the estate where the fourth company was quartered. Reinforcements, I expect, he remarked. Look, boys, surely that's Stepan Astachov, there in the third rank from the front, Groshev exclaimed, laughing gratingly. And there's Anikushka. Grigor, there's your brother. Do you see him? Narrowing his eyes, Grigor stared, trying to recognize the horse Pyotr was riding. Must have bought a new one, he thought, turning his gaze to his brother's face. It was strangely changed since their last meeting. Grigor went to meet him, taking off his cap and waving mechanically. After him poured the half-undressed Cossacks, avoiding the broken undergrowth of Angelica and Burdock. Led by an elderly, corpulent captain with a wooden, fixed expression on his authoritative lips, the detachment swung round the orchard into the estate. A stickler, Grigor thought, as he smiled with joyous agitation at his brother. Hello, Piotr, he shouted. Glory be, we're going to be together. How are you, Grigor? Oh, all right. So you're still alive, after a fashion. Greetings from the family. How are they all? Very well. Piotr rested his palm on the croup of his horse and turned his entire body round in the saddle, smilingly running his eyes over Grigor's form. Then he rode on and was hidden by the oncoming ranks of other Cossacks, known and unknown. Yegor Zharkov came from the lake dressed only in his shirt and hopping on one leg, trying to thrust the other into his trousers as he ran. Why, here's Zharkov, rose a shout from the ranks. Hello, stallion. Have they had to hobble you then? How's my mother? Zharkov asked. She's all right. She sent her love, but no presents. Things are difficult enough as it is. Yegor listened with an unusually serious expression to the reply and then sat down on his bare bottom in the grass hiding his anxious face, and struggling ineffectually to get his trembling leg into his trousers.